I think a materialist approach to things is very, very consistent with uh, my experience in Christian social justice. I feel like the, more, the deeper I get into anarchist practice, the deeper my faith is getting at the same time. I would hope that you know, securing means of life for all would be something all people of faith would say, oh yes, that's at the basis of what we believe. And those who are most marginalized know the most about the truth, the good and the beautiful. To me, it's less that I think building class solidarity is a bad thing, as much as it seems like if you don't attend to things like anti-black racism, um, that's always going to get in the way of building class solidarity, actually. And when you go back, you find that a lot of uh, revolutionary grassroots participatory movements, the, the precursors to what you could call um, the barrio assemblies and these like, you know, grassroots neighborhood organizations, a lot of these were sponsored by the church. What does it mean to say that the Christian tradition is internally contradictory and there are antagonisms there? Um, you're always uh, being faithful to some aspects and betraying other aspects. Welcome to the Magnificast, a podcast about Christianity and leftist politics. I'm your co-host, Dean Detloff. And I'm your other co-host, Matt Vernico. Matt, buckle up your Laudato seatbelt, because uh, Laudate, damn, Daniel, the Pope is back at it again, talking about the environment, climate change, giving us a whole new set of opportunities for puns, and I hope uh, you're ready for it. I'm not ready for it, but, <laughs> but here we are, just the same. <laughs> Uh, that's right, folks. Last week, we refreshed our memories a bit about the Pope's climate encyclical Laudato Si and the way it was connected with things like degrowth and dependency theory and all the things we like to talk about on this podcast. But this week, we have some big breaking Pope news. Get out your klaxons, your alarms, your sirens, your megaphones. The Vatican released uh, Pope Francis's most recent apostolic exhortation, which is called Laudate Deum, which means praise God. And we're going to talk a little bit through it. It's not as long as Laudato Si, but it's already having a pretty big impact, I think. Um, and lots of interesting things to say about it. Last time we pulled out some of Pope Francis's thoughts um, just around the economy and kind of maybe playing up some pieces of the document that have not been as prominent in, uh, I don't know, in the way that people deal with it and talk about it and take it up. And in Laudato Deum, or Laudate Deum, he picks up a lot of those themes, so we can pull those out. And also, he's more crabby about it, uh, which makes sense, because Laudato Si came out eight years ago, and things have only gotten hotter and worse since then. Uh, so you're getting a, a crabby pope this time around, and I'm, I'm here for the vibe. So in this episode, we're going to talk about Laudato Deum, and we're going to see what's changed and stayed the same in those last eight years. It's a good vibe. Um... The Pope is cranky. I'm cranky. We're all cranky here. And I think it's warranted in this in this uh, example. Uh, before we go any further, Dean, so our called shots last time were that he would talk about degrowth and Funko Pops. And uh, what were <laughs> yours again? Uh, that he was going to talk about peace and development. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Peace. Um, what else did I say even? I thought he was going to say something about, yeah, peace and war, um, how climate change affects the poor. And uh, I can't even remember what the third one was. But um, yeah, Matt, what's the scoreboard looking like anyway? Not great. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, I mean, he didn't. OK, hang on. So he didn't say the word degrowth, which is what I was, which was that's what I wanted. Mm -hmm. But he got pretty close, um, especially at the very end of the exhortation. He does say a big mean thing about the United States, which I really do appreciate. <laughs> and that's great. So that's good. He didn't say anything about Funko Pops, but again, the United States thing is kind of rolling it all into one. So I'm going to count that as one point for myself. Um, you look, let's see, Dean, you got pretty close, though. Um, he did say something about climate change affecting the poor more. Um, so that's like uh, that's a uh, that's at least one point for you. I don't know if the scoring system is here. He didn't really have a, anything to say about war, though. Um, so I think we're at one. We're, we're tied at one. to one. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I was actually surprised to see nothing about war. Oh, and, and the other thing I thought would be there for sure was something about debt, the debt of uh, countries in the global yeah. south. And there's nothing about debt in here. I mean, it's all on the margins and it's not like Pope Francis hasn't talked about it elsewhere. But I figured because this document was released with the intention of kind of putting people in a different headspace leading up to COP28, the big UN meeting of political people and others that will happen in Dubai this year. 
I thought for sure he was going to take that as an opportunity to talk about um, the need to restructure debt, but uh, he didn't. So those were actually surprises to me. I, I would have thought they'd be in there. He'll get it in the next one. That's sure. right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It was also... Uh, he'll, do, he'll do Ladato 3. <laughs> that's right. Uh, Ladato 3M. Um, he, uh, he also has been really stacking the, the Catholic media, so it's not like people haven't been busy with things to talk about. The one thing we're not talking about on this episode is the other piece of Pope news, which is the Synod on Synodality started um, on October 4th as well. The same day La Data Deum was uh, released. That's the Feast of St. Francis. And I don't know, probably we shouldn't talk about the Synod on Synodality until the very end. That's what I think. But uh, it's been a wild month for the church. Um, but I don't know, Matt, let's get into this document a little bit. So we've set the stage here. Let's um, do it. It's coming out ahead of COP28. It's been eight years since La Data C. What's your maybe general impression? What's the vibe just coming off in a general way from this exhortation? Yeah, well, in the notes, Dean, you did write exactly how you you wrote exactly what my vibe is, or you wrote exactly what the vibe I'm sensing is, and that is climate change is really bozo. <laughs> That's exactly the vibe of this whole thing. It's just like Pope Francis is writing this, and it's like, listen, it's been eight years, nothing has changed, it's gotten worse, and like there are still people out there who think this is like you know a joke, and they're idiots. <laughs> Not in so many words, maybe in more words than that actually, but. Uh, you can sense a sense of like uh, desperation, annoyance. There's some crabbiness for sure. It's a lot, a lot more terse. The language is not as flowery as um, you might find elsewhere. It's just like to the point. Here it all is, <laughs> and uh, things are bad. They're getting worse. Um, and then he wants to know whose fault is it, uh, and it's not the poor's fault. <laughs> that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. I do think that that is the general vibe of the the exhortation. Um, being crabby, climate change is really bozos. Uh, there is a moment where he basically almost says that. He says something like, uh, it might seem strange for me to be talking about this, uh, which is so plainly obvious for everyone. <laughs> but nevertheless, some people don't believe it. Yeah. Like, there's some pretty uh, impatient words, um, and rightly so. Uh, Pope Francis is trying to take stock of a pretty alarming climate situation, I think, too, Laudato Si did have some strong words. You know, most famously, Pope Francis said that our world is is becoming a uh, it's beginning to look like an immense pile of filth and had some other choice words. But uh, nothing like what you get in Laudato Deum, where there's a real kind of reckoning, I guess, with uh, with the actual damage yeah. that we're causing. Not only is climate change real, you bozos, but also there's a few points in there where he even says, you know, something that's kind of like. Um, the, the time for like like mourning or or recognizing how bad things is uh, without action is over. Mm -hmm. It's kind of this this uh, there's a feeling throughout this where like, you know, some people do know very well how bad climate change is and how much it's hurting, you know, people, creation and so on. But they haven't done anything about it yet. Mm -hmm. and Now it's time to. It's just like this real sense of like, come on. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Come on. <laughs> also, uh, that's, my, that's my favorite part is where he says that. That's right. And he does say it, you know, being in the Vatican with an Italian accent. So it really works. Um, I yeah, exactly. uh, <laughs> I think also it's it's maybe a harder document to um, I mean, it won't prevent people from being cynical with it, but it's harder to be cynical with it. Uh, Laudato Si has a lot of plausible deniability or maybe more vague gestures like Pope Francis will say, you know, richer countries do this and poorer countries do that. And there's kind of just a more, it's like easier to hide behind the lack of specificity. And Laudate Deum isn't naming names all over the place, but it does name some of them. You know, it, it names the United States uniquely. And I haven't looked, I'm going to look right now um, and see if there's been any commentary from somebody like Biden or John Kerry. There wasn't immediately, which I thought was pretty interesting. Um, I'm Googling it as we speak. And uh, yeah, let's see. Oh, man, I Googled it. And just two hours ago, there was a, uh, <laughs> a pretty interesting. Oh, breaking news. Yeah, that's right. Uh, article published say, with the headline Secretary of State not consulted on new papal document. Um, the Vatican Secretary of State, oh, that is. Oh, man, I wonder. Yeah. And uh, in it, it also says uh, John Kerry, the special U.S. envoy for climate change, had taken an interest in the papal document and offered suggestions in conversations with Vatican diplomats. But the Secretary of State did not have a chance to relay those suggestions before the papal document was completed. Uh, so I do love <laughs> the John Kerry snub. Um, good work, Pope Francis. 
Yeah. Uh, that's very interesting. Well, <laughs> good for good for the Vatican. Whether or not that was planned, I don't know. Yeah. Probably not. But I guess but, uh, like all that, that to was say John Kerry, he doesn't know. <laughs> he doesn't know. All that to say, you know, John Kerry has often um praised uh Led Up to see. I mean, he is a practicing Catholic and so is Joe Biden. And they'll talk about it as being a great encyclical and a good moral voice and so on and so forth. But I do think it's like maybe harder for John Kerry to quote La Dot de Dam. I mean, probably not. I don't know. Some of these people don't seem to have a lot of trouble sleeping at night <laughs> when they live their lives in, yeah. in bold contradiction. But uh, it just seems to me like La Dot La Dot de Dam is giving a little less wiggle room. The exhortation starts off um, investigating the question that. Uh, uh, you know, who's causing climate change? It's humans for sure. But whose fault is it specifically? And Pope Francis writes that it's not the poor's fault. And he says, in an attempt to simplify reality, there are those who would place responsibility on the poor since they have many children and even attempt to resolve the problem by mutilating women in less developed countries. As usual, it would seem that everything is the fault of the poor. Yet the reality is that, that a low, richer percentage of the planet contaminates more than the poorest 50% of the total world population, and that per capita emissions of the richer countries are much greater than those of the poorer ones. How can we forget that Africa, home to more than half of the world's poorest people, is responsible for a minimal portion of its historic emissions? All right, so you get it right here. Um, who's responsible? It's not the poor. It's not half of the world's poorest people who live in Africa. It's the people who pollute the most, and um, you can take a quick guess to who that is. It's the United <laughs> States. Um, of course, if you ask people like John Kerry in the United States or <laughs> other other officials, I guess, they'll tell you it's India's fault. They'll tell you it's China's fault, but really it's the United States. Um, the ways that people produce and consume there is out of control, um, and uh, you can go look up the, the data on this particular fact. Um, Jason Hinkle has written about this really specifically, and so have a lot of other people um, in the climate area. We've talked about it in previous episodes, and I even wrote a Sojourner's article about this, so go look it all up. Um, the <laughs> facts are out there. Do your own research. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's people in the United States. It's their fault. <laughs> don't don't believe the hype. Don't believe John Kerry. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I, I don't know why John Kerry has become like the villain of this podcast in the last couple of weeks, but um, he is, it's, and it's his yeah. own fault. He has no one to blame but himself. <laughs> Uh, and I mean, like we said last week in the Laudato Si piece, um, there's that kind of famous scene of John Kerry chastising people in Africa for, you know, not greening their economy, even though, as Pope Francis says right here, Africa is not, you know, to blame for kicking out all these historic uh, emissions. Um, so I think that's obviously the big piece, right? Pope Francis thinks that humans are causing climate change. He goes out of his way to spend a lot of time talking about that. Uh, but not all humans have maybe an equal share or equal role in that responsibility. And he goes on to also talk about the consequences of that situation in ways that I think are pretty helpful. Uh, he says, Some effects of the climate crisis are already irreversible, at least for several hundred years, such as the increase in the global temperature of the oceans, their acidification, and the decrease of oxygen. Ocean waters have a thermal inertia, and centuries are needed to normalize their temperature and salinity, which affects the survival of many species. This is one of the many signs that the other creatures of this world have stopped being our companions along the way, and have become instead our victims. We are now unable to halt the enormous damage we have caused. We barely have time to prevent even more tragic damage. Uh, I think this is a pretty troubling passage for a lot of reasons, but the two things that really stuck out to me were, first of all, Francis's acceptance of the gravity of the situation. Uh, you know, you hear all kinds of people who will be like, yeah, climate change, like it's bad. But if we just kind of figure out, you know, the right solution now, like we can kind of prevent um, all the all the bad stuff from happening. And Pope Francis yeah. is like, the bad stuff is going to happen. <laughs> what we have to do now is like prevent worse things from happening. And I think that is very helpful to see him say that. And the other thing is, like, I couldn't help but notice in Laudato Si and even on the Feast of St. Francis, you know, there's so much emphasis on Francis's kind of sibling relationship with the world, right? That the, the creatures are supposed to be our companions, our brothers and sisters. And what Pope Francis does in Laudato Deum is to present kind of like an anti-St. Francis vision. Like, that's what climate change is doing. Instead of having these uh, other creatures as our siblings, they've become instead our victims, which I think is a pretty challenging word and kind of suggests uh, a spirituality of climate change that I think is pretty compelling. 
there's about 13 other things I'd like to say about that particular point, but we'll save it for the book. Um, <laughs> maybe you guys don't know. Dean and I are we're, uh, we're writing this book about St. Francis and degrowth and all kinds of other things. And uh, some ideas about this is <laughs> are especially pertinent to that, that conversation, but we'll talk about it off the air to protect <laughs> our intellectual property. Um, but what you're saying, Dean, I think is, <laughs> is really important because uh, I don't know, m- maybe you, not, Everyone might remember this, so I'll remind you, since that's the whole role of having a podcast. But the uh, the recent IPCC reports that came out, right? They the, the big news in those reports was not that climate change could be turned around. Uh, the, the big news was that we are like locked into at, at least uh, 1.5 degrees Celsius of like an average temperature rise, and it's not that like that can be prevented in any way. I think is, is the important takeaway from that particular body of literature. Um, the thing that can be changed is how bad it will get. But I think that there's like, you know, whenever you hear anyone talking about fighting against climate change or, you know, maybe if we could get our butts in gear, we could really turn things around, but you can't, that you can't. In fact, um, Mm -hmm. there is, there's 100% will be like (laughs) irreversible or not irreversible, but there is 100% <laughs> will be warming temperatures that will only be able to be reversed, like, you know, in an extreme grand scale. So um, I think what Francis is saying here is important because uh, the situation is very dire. And I think to put it in this way really drives home that particular point. Yeah, exactly. And uh, the link he makes to the economy is important here, too. Uh, like we said, climate change is human caused, but not every human causes it in the same way or has the same degree of uh guilt or responsibility for causing it. And right off the bat in the exhortation, he says, regrettably, the climate crisis is not exactly a matter that interests the great economic power uh, powers whose concern is with the greatest profit possible at minimal cost and in the shortest amount of time, which is like we said on the last episode, a pretty standard line about uh, the, the fundamental contradiction of capitalism that profit Um, has the capacity to grow uh, exponentially and very quickly and so on. And uh, nature does not have that capacity. And so there's this kind of rift between the economy and the natural world. And I think the fact that Pope Francis is able to kind of drive home the seriousness of climate change, the real stakes of where we are, and also to connect that to the, these economic causes is really essential. It helps us, also avoid, I think, a trap that Christians can get into with things like stewardship language, where the idea is if we just yeah. kind of, you know, steward the world a bit better, if we all kind of do our part or kind of change our relationship to the world around us, then that will sort it out. And by tying it to the logic of, you know, the maximization of capital, the accumulation of capital, I think it just suggests there has to be a much stronger response uh, from the Christian tradition than you know, stewardship or personal responsibility, even though those things are important. And even in Laudate Deum, Pope Francis goes out of his way to say, it's not that you can't do anything in your personal life, but uh, your personal life is not going to be the thing that sorts it out. Yeah, exactly. Um, Okay, so we have that piece on the table. Things are bad. Climate change is really bozos. And uh, (laughs) not everyone is equally (laughs) responsible for it all. Great. That's a lot to have on the table already. But then the next piece of it actually is, I think, even more interesting or it gets even more pointed. So all those things are the case. um, But what's going to get us out of climate change, you might ask, or maybe not you, but somebody might ask that (laughs) an imaginary person um, or I mean, these people that ask this question are not so imaginary that, you know, it's uh, it's technology. There's going to be some kind of some kind of technological solution to get us out of climate change. Um, You know, we're going to build more solar energy places and more wind farms and more bioreactors and stuff. And um, Francis has a lot to say about people who think that. Um, And he spends, I think, I don't know, a good chunk of this exhortation railing against the idea of technocracy, that if we just follow the the lead of scientists, that we'll just like, uh, we'll get around climate change in some way. And man, it is a really good part um not only is there like a very interesting sort of philosophy of technology from francis within this uh but also i don't know uh you can't read this and and um not be convicted by it. i think i think he makes some really strong points so uh here's here's one one place to kind of start this part of the conversation um so any you know type of green 
power, technology, whether it's, you know, wind or solar or whatever, it needs a battery, right? That's it. And batteries um, <laughs> are not a green technology, as, as you might know or maybe might not know. And this is what Francis says about them. Without a doubt, the natural resource required by technology, such as lithium, silicon, and so many others, are not unlimited. Yet the greater problem is the, is the ideology underlying an obsession to increase human power beyond anything imaginable before, which non-human reality is a mere resource at its disposal. Everything that exists ceases to be a gift for which we should be thankful, esteem, cherish, and instead becomes a slave, prey to any whim of the human mind and its capacities. Um, this is a good place to start, I think, because uh, all of these things that exist in nature that you might need for a thing like a battery or, you know, other types of components for other, you know, electrical commodities, goods, products, whatever. Electric cars, um, all that stuff. Everything is... Com- Electric, co- yeah, totally. It's all commodified, and you're not, <laughs> you're not taking it seriously. But what he says is, is even worse than like the material reality of like, just extraction. There's also this underlying ideology about human power to kind of like overcome any problem, and it's like bonkers <laughs> because it it's like uh, I don't know, just like what he says. It's like uh, you're enslaving the planet. It becomes your prey. It's like uh, it's not like a thing that you coexist with or you're or is co-constitutive to you as a human being or creature on the earth is a thing that like, uh, you know, you become master over and then exploiter of. Um, so not only is extractivism a problem, but the ideology that makes extractivism uh, a thing <laughs> is even more of a problem. Yeah. There's a lot of kind of like a, an implicit theory of like finitude and a real strong criticism of technology in here that I think is really powerful and it extends and repeats a lot of what was already said in La Data C. Uh, things that I think people forgot are in La Data C are especially a pretty strong critique of things like green growth rhetoric and the idea that technology will save us or that if humans just kind of put their heads together, they can start it out. You know, I always think of like, <laughs> I feel like it's maybe every three months I see a new article about how Bill Gates wants to like blot out the sun with some bizarre cloud machine or something. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, when you hear stuff like that, it like, listen, I'm not a Luddite. Like, I don't like Jacques Ellul. I think, you know, some technology is good. I like recording this podcast. I like sending it to people on their phones. I think we should be critical about it, but also you got to use it. But uh, at the same time, there is definitely a kind of alienation from nature that technology does sort of uh, foster in us. Or, you know, if those terms are philosophically not good to somebody, uh, <laughs> technology does kind of send people in our own, in, in its own directions in ways that we don't always foresee. And Francis, I think, calls our attention to that in a pretty healthy way. Um, at one point, he says, not every increase in power represents progress for humanity. We do need only think of the admirable technologies, quote unquote, admirable, that were employed to decimate populations, drop atomic bombs and annihilate ethnic groups. There were historical moments where our admiration at progress blinded us to the horror of its consequences. Uh, this is like might sound like I don't know, someone just being a crank. And sometimes Pope Francis is a crank, but like in a good way, I think. I think you should be a crank about people who are too excited about technology. <laughs> um, it's a pretty common trope. I mean, anything you ever read in media theory, like the first thing you're going to learn is that all the stuff you like in your life is probably like not that far descended from somebody trying to kill somebody else. <laughs> you know, like uh, like we talked about a long time ago on this podcast, uh, Paul Virilio, for instance, has these really interesting links between um, the uh, the mechanism used to fire bullets at a rapid pace in a machine gun and the mechanism used in a, uh, a projector or a, a film, uh, a film projector to kind of show you movies. Right. So there's these kind of like weird ways that technologies, I don't know, like they get civilianized, but they also carry these violent capacities and, and in the other direction, too. Right. You uh, you can invent something innocuous and then it goes on to become a pretty violent uh, weapon or apparatus for violence. Um, and I think there's something important about saying that in the context of the climate crisis, you know, like uh, when Bill Gates is talking about like blotting out the sun. I don't know, like maybe that's something people should do, maybe not. But I just like don't trust Bill Gates to have the moral capacity to figure it out, you know, and Pope Francis is, yeah. I think, encouraging us to have a, a more critical eye toward those kind of technocratic solutions like you know, it's it's kind of one of those jokes like there's that that trope in philosophy that people would rather imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. 
And I think it's there's kind of a similar thing here where people would rather imagine kind of sci fi scenarios where, you know, we uh, yeah, we create a big a big cloud machine that lets us all live, you know, outside the sun or whatever for a little bit until we can figure out what's going on down here instead of like rejigging our economy so that we can just lead like a normal life and also enjoy the sun and so on. So uh, it's a a good word, I think, trying to tie together the economistic uh, critique here with the the technological critique. Yeah, for sure. I mean, (laughs) the things, the stuff about Bill Gates is like only half a joke too, um, (laughs) because he has, he has investigated things like that, like uh, geoengineering stuff, but also even, I mean, even more like seriously, you know, Bill Gates is like 110 percent behind nuclear energy and has all kinds of like investments and um, plans and stuff for for uh, keeping keeping his servers running. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) This guy who's who's built his entire life around um, Microsoft computers, which is, you know, has got to be the most depressing thing to really (laughs) think about. Uh, <laughs> he's committed to uh, existing through climate change, through nuclear power. I guess like that's that's part of like the uh, silliness of of technocracy, though, is that like these are the people who like we're entrusting our future to that, like uh, the Bill Gates of the world who really just wants his server farm to exist through climate change. Like that's who we have to count on for um, <laughs> for <laughs> for ideas around <laughs> saving the planet. Um, there's a, a few other places within this section, uh, within the exhortation where Francis specifically points towards democratic solutions to subsidiarity as an idea, uh, about local control around climate. And, uh, I think that can't really be overlooked mm-hmm. that, um, you know, capitalism is the problem for sure. The particular spiritual malady that's at the bottom of like these ideologies is, is important, but also Francis sees, um, technocracy is bad uh and democracy is good so take that (laughs) sorry yeah i think that subsidiarity piece is really important too you know something that we talk a lot about in the catholic development world that i think is good is that local communities usually know how to take care of their communities best i think that kind of logic does have its limits i mean sometimes local communities don't know what to do or what they're doing But when you think about like indigenous communities that have existed for centuries in a particular uh, bioregion and know how to live with it and in it and so on, uh, it's best to sort of be like, all right, they obviously know what they're doing. (laughs) You know, they don't need a Bill Gates solution to figure it out. Uh, And I think that is really essential to kind of recognize, too, that that's a, a harder path to follow, like kind of placing your bets on, you know, millions and millions of communities being entrusted to take care of their own watersheds or kind of derive political existence from their environment, I think is a pretty big bet to make. And it's not the only tool in the toolbox, you know, like Pope Francis does say also in Laudate Deum that uh, international state relations are the key to sorting it out because the problem is so huge and it, it scales up like you can't have a kind of anarchist retreat into localism. But nevertheless, there is this important moment for being like, local folks do know how to live with their own environments in a way that, you know, you just like when you're at a cop meeting or something, that's like not the kind of thing that you can enter into in your imagination. And there's a severe disconnect there too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, there's a lot to say about that. Uh, We have an episode. mm, I don't know. That's probably kind of old now (laughs) about subsidiarity (laughs) and how that works out and uh, what it could mean for politics. So you can scroll through the feed and find that, I guess. (laughs) <laughs> or don't. It's fine. No big deal. We just made a podcast about it. And yeah, I guess you could listen to it if you wanted, but you don't have to. By the way, I'm uh, I'm glad to see that Scotland hasn't uh, destroyed your kind of Midwestern need to uh, self-deprecate. That's important. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It's actually just increased it. Um, I feel so <laughs> unsure and uneasy about everything here. I have to be more self-deprecating than ever. <laughs> Scottish people do not know what to do with that. Um, it's funny. Uh, <laughs> for me uh okay the next piece of this that we can talk about though is um francis's thoughts on anthropocentrism um we are we're running short on time so i don't want to spend like too much because it's kind of baked into the whole piece here um but anthropocentrism is a problem for francis um you can see the critique of anthropocentrism in this particular passage from francis he says this itself excludes the idea that the human being is extraneous a foreign element capable of only harming the environment 
Human beings must be recognized as a part of nature. Human life, intelligence, and freedom are elements of the nature that enriches our planet, part of its internal workings, and its equilibrium. Um, so I think that's a pretty important idea that, it, again, like it's kind of everywhere in this piece. He says this kind of thing a few different times. Um, there's another part that I think is worth talking about a bit more because it, it got a little bit more play on the internet because of how unusual it is. But a little bit later in the section, Francis says, God has united us to all his creatures. Nonetheless, the technocratic paradigm can isolate us from the world that surrounds us and deceives us by making us forget that the entire world is a, quote, contact zone. Um, this phrase contact zone is a it's in quotes because it comes from a philosopher named Donna Haraway, who is who is she's Catholic in this like not very Catholic kind of way. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe um, she plays with the idea of Catholicism a lot in her works, uh, but she is definitely like uh, if you are interested in the philosophy of technology or feminist philosophy or any number of other weird sort of niche things in continental philosophy. She's a person that maybe you've heard of, um, but she is quite famous uh, for writing a book called The Companion Species, where she's writing about how weird it is that humans have pets. <laughs> it's not really about that. It's about something kind of bigger. That It's the idea that like um, that, uh, you know, that humans and dogs are they share a, like a co-evolutionary history. And uh, the point of the book is to argue that like that is not like an exception to how evolution works, but it's like basically just how evolution works, that species are often co-constitutive um, so that, you know, dogs evolve alongside us and so do cats and, you know, um, other creatures evolve alongside other kinds of creatures within their own ecosystems. And uh, there's a sense in which that like, uh, it, you know, to, to be to be a being in the world, <laughs> extremely philosophical <laughs> to be a being in the world means that you're not evolving. You're not coming to be in a vacuum, but you're always coming to be like out of the relationship to other things. And that's quite unique actually. And Francis here is kind of affirming this weird um, <laughs> kind of a kind of not Catholic feminist philosopher who I think would definitely, you know, they have a lot of disagreements with, I would say. <laughs> um, but anyways, uh, Francis is, uh, it's an interesting move though, right? That he's, uh, he's going, he's going so far out of his way to um, argue against anthropocentrism. He's like, uh, you know, he's basically like adopting the language of a type of philosophy who, you know, he would probably disagree with and a lot of other things. Um, but he doesn't nonetheless because, Donna Harway is right, man. <laughs> That's why. That's why he does it. So I don't know. I cannot wait. So there must someday soon. There's probably going to be a, a Donna Harway response oh, yeah. to this. Um, but uh, I don't know. It's rad. It's good. <laughs> um, Donna Harway is a person you should read. Uh, go out of your way to do it. It's good for you. Yeah, maybe we should read the Companion Species Manifesto for a future episode. It is pretty fun. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean that choice i guess also signals a lot of other things i think it signals that pope francis wants to draw from a wider uh, set of voices outside the church or kind of adjacent to the church which i think is important and also like it's pretty radical to cite haraway like she is a feminist she has a history of marxism she is like a pretty intense person to read <laughs> i guess for lack of a better adjective um, she makes a lot of wild arguments about how you're actually a cyborg and, uh, what a weird thing that is. Um, all that to say lots of kind of wild, uh, wild things in her literature that Francis choosing to cite, um, kind of opens up maybe in a unique way, but that critique of anthropocentrism is really important. And I think it also speaks to like a deeper philosophy of technology within Francis's work, like. Uh, and at another point, he says, human groupings have often created an environment, reshaping it in some way without destroying or endangering it. Uh, that is actually a pretty like profound um, media theory insight. Uh, I talk about this guy, Peter Slotardek, a lot in this podcast, who, um, again, has a lot of bad right wing politics. But uh, he is very obsessed with this idea specifically that humans create different environments. And I think he's probably right about that. Uh, and it's cool to see Francis, I guess, sort of entering into a conversation around um, how we mediate the world and how how we interact with the world. Um, he's doing a lot of things in Laudate Dam. You know, he's talking about the environment, but he's connecting it to other things. He talks about AI in this document. He talks about kind of the uh, the challenges of the green revolution for things like jobs and so on. So 
uh, it's cool to see him maybe uh, reaching out and borrowing from a lot of sources to to boost that case for why Catholics and others should really get involved here. Yeah, for real. Um, we could talk a lot more about this, but let's keep going so we can we can get through this whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next session, the next section is about multilateralism and international politics. And man, another another one where he kind of knocks it out of the park with some interesting ideas and borrowing some phrases and ideas from other people. Um, but before we get there, let's say this. This is where he starts. It continues to be regrettable that the global crises are being squandered when they could be the occasions to bring about beneficial changes. This is what happened in the 2007 to 2008 financial crisis and again with the COVID-19 crisis. I think this is such an interesting point because uh, he is... <laughs> Being really optimistic, really hopeful, I guess that the idea that there's like these ruptures could become something important for something else, but he's just like it sucks because they didn't, <laughs> and and everything is always just sort of back to back to business as usual. Um, but a good point nonetheless. Yeah, I mean, there's something kind of heartbreaking about it in Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis's other big encyclical. He talks about this exactly. He wrote it during um, the pandemic, and he has a, a lot about crises and what crises are for and what you can do with them or not do with them. And he kind of makes a, a plea and a bet in Fratelli Tutti by saying, if we really took advantage of the crisis of the pandemic, we would find our bonds of solidarity strengthened. And if we fail, if we squander that crisis, then we're going to find that it does even more damage. You know, it, it erodes what is already a pretty small spot for solidarity. And it is pretty sad to see Pope Francis being like, and that's what happened. <laughs> like, we didn't do that. Uh, so that's tough. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, we'll talk about what he thinks about hope in a minute. Uh, the key, though, is that the fact that state actors especially haven't dealt with crises in an important way doesn't stop him from imagining what they ought to do and making some recommendations that I think are pretty, I don't know, sensical. Um, he says, for example, uh, there's kind of a lot of failure in the document that he um, records, like, you know, the the COP conferences at the UN have failed to address climate change. State actors have kind of reneged on their commitments and they're uh, even when they do something good, they tend to kind of half ass it, you know, and that's not so good. Uh, but he does say that, like, even in the failure of states to act, nevertheless, there are some pretty important spaces outside of that. Uh, he talks about multilateralism across states, but he also has this kind of interesting passage where he says, in the medium term, globalization favors spontaneous cultural interchanges, greater mutual knowledge and processes of integration of peoples, which end up provoking a multilateralism from below and not simply one determined by the elites of power. The demands that rise up from below throughout the world where activists from very different countries help and support one another can end up pressuring the sources of power. It is to be hoped that this will happen with respect to the climate crisis. For this reason, I reiterate that unless citizens control political power, national, regional, and, regional, and municipal, it will not be possible to control damage to the environment. Uh, I think that is pretty great. And like, a call for a legitimate people's government. <laughs> I think we have to be honest about that. Mm -hmm. uh, and the fact that it's a sort of call that's made with reference to international solidarity is really important and impressive because, you know, the easy thing would be like, okay, the Pope, he's a big player in a big institution. And it would be easy to just say, okay, as that big player, he's going to make an appeal to other big players and other big institutions. And they'll kind of all sort it out at the top. And instead, what you get in this document is like, listen, those big players have failed and like they're going to meet again and probably they'll fail again there, too. And what you need to do in in light of that failure is make connections outside the top. Like we're not going to get saved by the uh, the elected officials or unelected representatives of power bodies. And we kind of have to figure out a way to make those structures accountable to actual people, to citizen control. I think that is like. I don't know if there's anything that comes out of Laudate Deum. I just really hope that that's a passage that people can keep boosting and amplifying. Those are the kinds of things that Pope Francis says that get kind of lost in other stuff in documents that he writes, I guess, because it's like harder to operationalize and more politically radical. But for that reason, all the more important to insist that like it's there. <laughs> the Pope was calling for people's government. You got to find a way to, to action, actionalize that call. I don't know if that's a word, but I'm using it. You got to actionalize it. I've been learning a lot of French, and they have a lot of words like this, so that's uh that's what we've got to do. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think I would 
I would go along with actionalizing it. That sounds okay <laughs> to me. Um, that yeah, you're right though. Anyways, uh, the people's government from the Pope. It's from his mouth. You can't you can't argue with it. It's in there at least, and uh, it is very interesting. <laughs> but it will probably be one of the the forgotten <laughs> the forgotten sayings of Pope Francis later on. <laughs> um, though uh, okay, so we've got uh, we've got the people's government. We've got Donna Haraway in the mix. Uh, and this next part, I was actually kind of floored to read, uh, given the relationship of Catholicism and the Vatican to postmodernism. Um, <laughs> But here we go. He says, postmodern culture has generated a new sensitivity towards the more vulnerable and less powerful. That is the woke culture. <laughs> this is connected with my insistence in the encyclical letter for Telly Tutti on, on the primacy of the human person and the, and the defense of his or her dignity beyond every circumstance. It's another way of encouraging multilateralism for the sake of resolving the real problems of humanity, securing before all else respect for the dignity of persons in such a way that ethics will prevail over local or contingent interests. Um, I don't know the uh, the reference to postmodernism making uh, making a new sensitivity towards uh, the more vulnerable is such an interesting claim and. It seems true in some ways, at least. But anyways, um, the larger point about encouraging multilateralism here uh, along those lines is is also a pretty interesting thing. I don't know. It's hard hard to imagine, I think, a pope besides Francis saying this stuff <laughs> like before now. It's just like uh, it's all it's all a particular experience that we're, <laughs> we're having together. And it, it seems like nothing like this has ever quite happened before. Yeah. Well, I think I've said this on the pod before, but. The way I read the last three popes, you get John Paul II. He's the Husserl Pope, the phenomenology Pope. Uh, pope Benedict, he's the Habermas Pope. Pretty nervous about postmodernism in general. And by the time you get to Francis, you get the Levinas Pope. The guy is really concerned about the other. There and uh, I think we finally did it. We finally got there. Um, scared of what will happen. Oh, man. What? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> extremely afraid of the next pope. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's interesting, too, though, that like one thing that Francis says that maybe is out of step with postmodernism in a good way is that there is still a kind of um, role for institutions to play and there's a role for politics to play. Uh, and in fact, he says it's not a matter of replacing politics, but of recognizing that the emerging forces are becoming increasingly relevant and are in fact capable of obtaining important results in the resolution of concrete problems, as some of them demonstrated during the pandemic. The very fact that answers to problems can come from any country, however little, ends up presenting multilateralism as an inevitable process. I think that is pretty interesting, right? That like, yeah, you should have a sensitivity to the other. We should be kind of building up civil society organizations and so on. But that's not like in the absence of politics. And in fact, it should it should suggest a a better politics, which is something postmoderns are always notoriously kind of nervous about. So cool to see him, you know, (laughs) moving past that limitation, at least. Yeah, man. Now that you said that he's the Levinas Pope, that's all making a lot more sense to me. <laughs> I feel like that's extremely right. <laughs> there's got to be a there's a PhD dissertation out there. I'm sure that is exactly this point. Yeah, but uh, I think it's a strong case. <laughs> um, so lots of great critique, but he does kind of end the letter on some specific notes that I think are really instructive as well. Uh, oh, I should add to uh, he does have some pretty, pretty funny words about like the multipolar world that we live in. Um, you know, he calls for greater dialogue and kind of a realistic um, assessment of the fact that people do need to talk to each other because there's not just one power uh, throwing everybody around anymore, at least not in the same way, namely the U.S. So I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm not a multipolarista, but uh, for those that are, I guess Pope Francis offers also a good sobering word to be like, <laughs> people have to learn to talk to each other, not just like be pissed. Anyway, speaking of multipolarism and multilateralism, uh, COP 28 is about to happen. So COP meetings or called, uh, it's called that way because they're conference of parties meetings, COP. Um, they happen, they're organized by the United Nations and they are kind of like spaces for people to for world leaders to talk about the environment and climate change they've been going on since the 90s and the 28th one is going to happen this year it starts at the very end of november but mostly in december in dubai which is an incredibly weird place to have a big meeting about climate change but i guess that's what they're going to do and la data Deum is released for sure with the intention of trying to shape the discourse that happens there and i think the fact that he is calling out a specific conference is really good and important 
Uh, again, there's just less kind of vagueness around it and some more direct words. Um, I mean, he's spoken out kind of in different ways than other cops. He had a pretty strong uh, address, actually, at the cop that happened in Glasgow um, several years ago. But uh, in this case, you can see him really, you know, pushing on the gravity of the situation uh, toward the, the COP28 meeting. And I think there's lots of reasons to be cynical about it. Probably should be a little bit cynical about it. Um, climate conferences, they just have not obviously halted climate change. And this is the 28th one happening. Right. And like, <laughs> here we are. Uh, the 28th one probably also won't solve it. But uh, Pope Francis does make space for talking about hope. And I like the way that he puts it here. He says, to say that there's nothing to hope for would be suicidal, for it would mean exposing all humanity, especially the poorest, to the worst impacts of climate change. And I think that is actually a pretty essential word leading up to what is sure to be, in many ways, a pretty discouraging, as they always are, discouraging kind of climate conference. Totally. I mean, if any, if, if the encyclical is telling us anything, though, that it's like, uh, COP28 will come and it will go and it, it could be a little bit of a success. It could be more of a failure. I mean, certainly one of those two things. Right. But the thing that, that, that Francis is telling us before this, though, is that like that's not necessarily where the hope right. lies um, in in sort of like stodgy and um, stupid ideological kind of camps um, from the world's various. Um, I don't know. Uh, like uh climate delegates or whatever you might call them i don't know that's not not where the the hope of the world lies it's you know it's like it's in the people it's in it's in this other type of like uh way of thinking um i mean whatever something good could come out of cop and that would be very cool but uh it's uh <laughs> But anyways, that's not like the main attraction, mm -hmm. I guess, in, in this whole thing. Yeah. And I mean, he goes out of his way to actually even like he walks through them kind of piece by piece, too, about like, you know, what was good about Kyoto? What was good about, you know, or what was bad about Glasgow? Well, and then, you know, maybe something more will come out of it. You know? But but it's like, I guess the way he talks about it is just like um, you get the feeling that it's not it's not the way that the world will sort of like deal with climate change mm -hmm. you know he's talking he was talking about like the the failure of the paris accords and all of this other kinds of stuff and you get the feeling though that he's you have to pay attention to this because this is where important things happen but it's also like not where everything will be solved because the problem is so much bigger than anything that can be solved at mm -hmm. something like cop 28 mm -hmm. exactly and i mean he even i guess one thing that he tries to do is tie those cop meetings to external political pressures in a way that's helpful, too. So it's like, yeah, you're not going to get what you need out of the cop meetings, but you could actually get stuff that you wouldn't get otherwise if you didn't engage in a way that that matters. Yeah. Like, you know, the most recent thing that we got out of the last cop in Egypt last year is the establishment of a loss and damage fund, which is kind of like a climate reparations fund. And it is insufficient. It's not good enough. Uh, it's, you know, lots more to say about it. It can definitely absolve state actors from actual responsibilities and structural change and all that kind of stuff. You know, like all those risks are real, but also like they could just like not have any money <laughs> go to the poor, you know, and uh, it's not to accept the band aid as a solution, but just to say, you know, like. The key is to not kind of turn your nose up at reforms, but to figure out, OK, how do you get a reform? But more importantly, how do you kind of push the reform beyond the ceiling that the reform tries to establish? And I think Pope Francis is actually kind of pushing in that direction. Like, how do you make a reform a non-reformist reform? And that really depends on mm -hmm. political pressure outside those spaces. A lot, a lot better way to say it than I did. So I appreciate <laughs> that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, to round this episode out, let's take a quick turn here and kind of talk about how Francis ends the exhortation um, because it's a, in a very interesting way. So he talks about multilateralism and talks about cop and all this kind of stuff. He turns his eyes specifically to the United States and says, you, you, United States in particular, are bad. <laughs> and I do love that. Um, so I'm going to read this and we can we can talk a little bit about what's happening in it. Uh, so Francis writes, efforts by households to reduce pollution and waste and to consume with prudence are creating a new culture. 
The mere fact that personal, family, and community habits are changing is contributing to greater concern about the unfulfilled responsibilities of the political sectors and indignation at the lack of interest shown by the powerful. And then the next paragraph, he says, if we consider that emissions per individual in the United States are about two times greater than those of individuals living in China and about seven times greater than the average of the poorest countries, we can state that a broad change in the in the irresponsible lifestyle connected with the Western model would have a significant long-term impact. As a result, along with indispensable political decisions, we would be making progress along the way to genuine care for one another. Okay, this is important, I think, for a few different reasons. Specifically because, I mean, the United States is bad, but (laughs) the thing that he's drawing out here is really important for people in the West, for Catholics in the West to read this, for anyone in the West to read this, that, uh, you know, reusing, recycling, it's all great. Re- oh, sorry, reducing too. You got to get, <laughs> get that one in there. Reducing, reusing, recycling. We love them. They're great. Please do it. It can't be bad. Um, changing your community habits is even good. But the thing is that even at the end of the day, people in the United States are living like far outside their 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 means, their bounds, outside their climate budget. Um, and that if people in the West could just simply stop doing that, it would be a big deal and it would be good for everyone else in the entire world. Mm -hmm. And so first of all, this is great because this is the, this is the degrowth Pope (laughs) move. This is the degrowth Pope moment. Um, and we're finally getting it. And, uh, this is where I'm claiming my one point on the scoreboard. Um, Degrowth means uh, not a reduction in consumption and production for everybody, but a reduction in consumption uh, for the people who are producing and consuming the most and then reorienting the rest of the world um, in, you know, along those lines. All I'd say, I think this is interesting that he does specifically he like, you know, you can um, you can say things about the poor. You can say things about, you know, the wealthy and the economic system, these abstracts. But I think it is really interesting to say specifically the way that people live in this country is bad. <laughs> and that country is United, the United States. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just an interesting move. It's a, a little bit more pointed than the rest, I think. Yeah, I think so, too. And also, I can't help but read that as something that has emerged after the last COP as well, because that was a huge top talking point among mm-hmm. rich Western nations at COP27 is like, why are you pointing your fingers at us when you could be wagging them at China and India who are producing, you know, more emissions uh, on, on the whole or whatever in all these different ways. And it was like insane because all, all these activists and scholars went out of their way to point out both this point that per capita emissions in the U S are actually astronomically higher than in even those countries, uh, not to mention poorer countries. Uh, but also the, uh, the emissions cost per capita is even higher than we record in the U S if you consider the fact that much of the emissions in China and India are happening because they're fulfilling consumer demands that are made in the United States. You know, if there weren't those demands, there wouldn't be the production. And I think that's, uh, interesting to see too, that Pope Francis is kind of paying attention. It seems like to me to the rhetoric that Western and wealthy countries are using to sort of pass the buck or absolve themselves or find somebody else to, you know, to make climate change their problem as a way of ignoring their own role to play. And like, I get it, like, (laughs) reducing your consumption is hard to do. Um, And honestly, probably most people listening to this podcast probably already don't consume a lot comparatively, right? Like, uh, that is I would just assume the case Uh, we're really talking about like an appetite for consumption that um, the U S foists foists onto um, especially people with means, but also exports all the way around the world and just tries to kind of create a culture of accumulation. And I think it's like important for Pope Francis to be paying attention to how, again, just how those countries are trying to like ignore their, their big role to play in the climate crisis. Yeah, totally. And it's not necessarily to demonize any one person. I mean, it could be. Um, <laughs> but like, I mean, John I, mean Kerry. In, I guess what when I'm like, John, it's John Kerry's fault specifically, I guess, is, is what I like to say. But also the other point is that like it is a it is a culture of consumption in the United States. So so much that like if you live in the United States, it's kind of like unavoidable. It's not like, you know, you could live outside that particular mm-hmm way i mean you could you could try there's like you know a particular like lifestyle that maybe you could cultivate over time and with your community where maybe you could escape the orbit of some of that like 
those bad consumptive habits. And that would be really cool in a worthwhile project. Don't let me tell you otherwise. But in a lot of ways, I mean, you're like inculcated with it, whether you like it or not, because um, you live in a city where you have to drive necessarily so, right? Or you have mm-hmm. to go shop at at Walmart or whatever. There are all kinds of ways that we're, um, we're brought into the system of production and consumption against our will. And there's nothing you can really do about it besides the Pope's people's government, but, <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's, it's a bad system. The United States, I got to tell you. Um, but it's not like, it's not like every individual in the United States is at fault for it, mm-hmm. but we do, we all do participate in it one way or the other. Mm-hmm. So it's like, you know, the, the problem is multifaceted. Uh, and also the response, the way that <laughs> who exactly is responsible is also distributed in a different way than you might think. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, we're reaching the end here, Matt. Uh, La date dam. What do you think um, on on a scale of one to five, knowing all the other exhortations that you've read and loved? Uh, where does this one rank? How do you feel about it? What's your your final parting thoughts about this exhortation? I like this one a lot. Um, La to see is cool. Don't get me wrong. For Telly Tutti, it's good. Um, but La Donna Dam is just like <laughs> it's so it's very pointed. It's very crabby. It's like uh to me, it's like the most real thing that the Pope has written. Um, and by real I mean like most like human thing that he's written. It's not like overly theological, even though it makes some really profound points. It's just like there's a big problem and we should really confront that problem in a serious way. And people who don't are bad. <laughs> and, and that's kind of the the moral of the story. I don't know. It, it's not uh, it's not over, overly theologized. It's not uh, it's not over the top in any way. It's just extremely like this is how it is. And I'm the pope and I'm going to tell you about it. And I think that's great. So so far, this is on the top of my shelf. <laughs> I can't wait for Verso to publish this one <laughs> as a great like uh, chapter two in the Lodossi book. Uh, what do you think, Dean? I agree. I think. People expected and I expected that the document would be a lot longer, would have a lot of other things in it. And I think that even there might have been a sense of some disappointment or that's kind of what I sensed in some of the discourse that it wasn't as long as some other exhortations even have been. I mean, exhortations are usually not extremely long, but they can be a lot longer than this. But the more I've thought about it and the more I've read it, the more I feel like actually the brevity of it is great. It kind of helps to punctuate the issues. It puts things in pretty stark perspective. And I think it challenges the reader, too, to be like, what else do I need to say about this? You know, (laughs) like the problems are really obvious. I think that's the tone that comes across in a way that's really helpful. And I, I like the way you put it. It's like a very real document, a very human document. It's just sort of saying, let's be honest. You know, we all know what's happening here. We all know who could change things and isn't changing things. And here's maybe some ideas for what we could do on the margins. And you get the sense that it's a pretty like exhausted kind of document. Uh, And I think that's important. Like, you know, it's not as energizing as some other documents that Pope Francis writes. But in a in a weird paradoxical way, I find that more more spiritually fulfilling. (laughs) You know, like it feels like, dang, finally, somebody's sort of saying something really true and real and honest. And that's good. I I think that's good to point out because like in Fratelli 2 to even it's like, you know, how do you become like a better, (laughs) a better brother to all of of all of creation or something, (laughs) all of humankind? How do you become the, the, the good Samaritan on the road who will stop and like help people up or whatever? And this one is just like, man, stuff is very bad. (laughs) (laughs) And have you considered a people's government? (laughs) Thanks for listening to The Magnificast. If you like what you heard and you want to support what we do, you can find us on Patreon at patreon.com slash The Magnificast. Um, there's not nothing else to say, I don't think. Uh, our music is by Amari Armstrong. The outro is by The Illogical Spoon. And we'll see you next week. I don't want to get up for church in the morning, church in the morning, souls alive. Heaven come to earth and there won't be no church We'll meet down by the riverside There we'll swim with all creation Never get tired, never bored Don't worry, someday There'll be no dam between us and our Lord Jackson, keep your hoods up Keep your hoods up And you stay up late 
Jackson, you keep your hoods up, well you keep your hoods up, and you stay up late, oh don't mind, a cold night, but we might mind if you leave too soon, so come on now, it's still early, at least I would have.